We read in the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. 1 Corinthians 1, 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, now there are not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that, according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. How be it? We speak wisdom among them that are perfect. And not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, I would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I want us to think more particularly this morning... <coughs> about the last, last part of the passage we read, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6. We speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Uh, them that are perfect would perhaps be better translated with something like those that are mature. We speak wisdom among the mature. Not the wisdom of this world, but we speak the wisdom of God. In that whole passage that we read, Paul is contrasting the wisdom of this world and the true wisdom. The wisdom which comes from knowing God, knowing God's ways, knowing God's salvation, and walking in the ways of God. And it is worth reflecting that there are different types of wisdom. Worth reflecting to start off with, that wisdom and knowledge are not the same thing. It is in these days... Not very difficult to acquire a great deal of knowledge. The average young man or young woman today knows a very great deal more than a university professor would have known four or five hundred years ago. Doesn't mean that that said young man or young woman is necessarily wiser than the university professor. Doesn't mean, of course, that he's not either. The modern young man or young woman in any individual case may be far wiser than that university professor. All that I want us to see at the beginning is that it is possible to acquire a very great deal of knowledge 
and yet to be far from being wise. Wisdom and knowledge should never be confused. This is important for us because we live in a day when knowledge is extending on every hand in the realms of science and technology. There isn't a doubt that this age stands far ahead of any age that the world has ever known. We know now how to work at science, how to work at technology, and we can do things that no previous age could ever do. And there's always a temptation because of the spectacular character of our achievement. We put a man on the moon. Nobody else in any previous generation has ever been able to do that. And you notice how easily we all are able to claim a share in that. Even Australians, though, we have nothing at all to do with it. But we do, you know. We've got a tracking station down there, which, uh, uh, if it's of any interest to you, receive pictures from the moon one half second before you get them over here. Um, but we so readily climb on the bandwagon and we share in taking the credit for the tremendous achievements that, uh, that take place. But nobody, I think, would claim that this is a great age for art, for literature, a great age morally and spiritually. And we need a sense of balance, you see. We ought not to be dazzled by the fact that in certain directions our age is preeminent over all other ages. We ought not to reason from them, though it's very easy to do it, to think that we stand head and shoulders above everybody else. We don't. It's easy for us to think that we are wiser than our predecessors, but wisdom and knowledge are not the same thing. Um, and as we think this morning over the wisdom of the world and uh, what Paul calls the wisdom of God, I want us to think of it in this way. The wisdom of this world uh, tends to be both optimistic and pessimistic. It's a kind of contrary thing. And the true wisdom contradicts it both ways. It tends to be both pessimistic and optimistic. Well, now let's have a look at this highly paradoxical situation. There is a worldly optimism. The spirit of the age is a spirit which thinks that there is no problem that man cannot solve. It comes very easily out of our excellence in technology and in science, as I have said, and we have a a spirit of, uh, of pride in our achievement. Uh, we, we think we are well and truly ahead of everybody else. It takes a, a great deal of mental adjustment before we can understand that in earlier days, for instance, men really thought that their fathers were wiser than they. I mean, this just wasn't uh, something that they made up. They thought it. And the good old days, which is a good for a laugh with us any time we produce it, was something that men believed. It's only in, in very modern time that we've gotten to think that there never were any good old days. People have always had a, a certain humility about their achievement. Uh, they have felt that there were great men in an earlier day and that the present day doesn't measure up. But not now. Now, we think that we are superior to all others. And so we march ahead trying to demonstrate our superiority. And this sometimes leads to rather curious things. There's, uh, for instance, the liberal spirit which was abroad, say, at the turn of the century. Uh, a, a spirit which uh, led men to question ancient institutions and to try and bring about social change, which they did in, in uh, many areas of the world in a, a very big way. And it's fascinating to reflect that out of one and the same general attitude that man's future is in his own hands, that man is able to cope with his environment, that man is steadily getting better and better, that emerge as opposite movements, as Nazism and Communism. He's both came out of this sense of man's inherent sense of his own superiority. 
but in what very different results this could uh, could could work out in different ways in different places rather. Now there's this inherent contradiction in man's liberal attitude. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that liberal spirit is something to to be objected to. A great deal of our progress is due to that, and so long as people accept unquestioningly what happened in an earlier age, progress is impossible. It is important that we do question the assumptions of an earlier age. It is important that we do have that liberal spirit which welcomes true ideas no matter how new and no matter from what area they come. All that I am saying at this point is that where historically we had that liberal spirit which was supreme early in the century, it could and did issue in tyrannical movements and that in more directions than one. Uh, the tyranny of Nazism and fascism, the tyranny of communism. Uh, that wasn't, of course, all that it, it resulted in. Uh, it resulted also in the technological advance to which I have referred, uh, the uh, rocketry which is so much a feature of modern life that has come out of it, but much more important for ordinary people is the effect on... Oh, on our lives of the effects of science. For instance, we worship this morning in an air-conditioned sanctuary, which people couldn't have done a hundred years ago. And if you stop to reflect a while, you will see that all the way around us, our lives are sheltered and covered by a multitude of comforts which are due to the fact that man has been able to make spectacular advances. Now, over against this, the Christian faith puts a resounding negative. Because man has made such advance, because man is able to do such great things, man naturally tends to think that the solution of all his problems is possible. All he has to do is to keep on applying the modern techniques, and things will work out all right. And over against that, the Christian faith maintains that man that unless something is done about man, always there will emerge something which is wrong. And I think that this scarcely needs to be demonstrated. As you look out over the world, there are tensions and difficulties everywhere. In a tremendous country like this of yours, there are, for instance, racial difficulties which even you, with all your knowledge and techniques and traditions, have not been able as yet to solve. Don't get me wrong here. Don't think I'm picking on the Americans. We've got our own difficulties in Australia. And every country of which I have personal knowledge has tremendous difficulties in the realm of personal relations. These are days when mental illness the world over is on the increase, it would seem. And one reason for it is that men are not able to handle the problems of modern life. It's a complicated affair to live in an age like ours. And we just don't know how to do it. Indeed, it, it would be fair to say, I think, that for all our vaunted advancement, we have not made significant progress in the realm of personal relationships. I know that there are certain people who have. I know that there are people who specialize in counseling and who have worked out quite a lot of very valid and useful techniques. But look at the community as a whole. And it is fair to say that we have not really solved the problem. Again, we haven't solved the problem in international relationships. It's incredible if it weren't happening. That's right in the middle of this 20th century. Uh, we have wars. Vietnam, Middle East, just more lately, uh, strife and difficulty in Northern Ireland. Uh, men are not able to handle the problem of personal relationships. And to the worldly minded, this is probably a matter for great surprise, not for the Christian. The Christian believes that unregenerate man is always capable of tremendous evil. Indeed, that always he will produce evil. That is as natural as night following day. 
And so, over against the optimism of the world, which says that man can do it if he sets his mind to it, the Christian faith sets its negative, no, he can't. There is that in the nature of man which is evil, and which means that man left to himself cannot produce a victory over all the difficulties that he meets. Well, sometimes even the world realizes this. And so over against the worldly optimism, we also see a worldly pessimism. Some of our best thinkers today, and I'm not talking about about Christian men necessarily, uh, in the world at large, some of our best thinkers are very pessimistic. Most of our modern writers of any distinction are men who are pessimistic about the ultimate outcome. And some of the things which bother men are the fact that our best efforts very often yield us results not easily distinguishable from our worst efforts. I've already spoken, for example, of the way in which the the liberalism, the evolutionary optimism of the turn of the century issued in both communism and Nazism. Now, these can be said to be the outcome of the best and the worst in man. Communism, I think, without a doubt, represents the perversion of what is best in man. Uh, see, there's something fine about the communistic ideal. The communist wants to create a society in which ancient orders have no particular privilege, in which everybody contributes according to his ability, and everybody receives according to his need. And the destruction of private property and the rest are not thought of by the true original idealistic communist as great ends in themselves, but as the means to bring in a greater good, that perfect society in which there will be no classes competing with one another, uh, no upper group of people uh, preying on the lower group, uh, but all living in peace and harmony together. Well, that's communist theory. But the ultimate result, as communism has worked out wherever it has been tried, hasn't been very different from what happened in Nazi Germany, where you don't have the effort to produce the best for all mankind, but where you have a state which is built openly and avowedly on hatred and certain racial theories uh, which stress the uh, superiority of some groups by nature to others, and, uh, well, there's no need for me to go into that in detail. But this impresses a lot of modern thinkers. When man's wisdom tries to produce something which is good, when he acts completely altruistically, when he is selfless, when, like the original communist, he is ready to die for his cause if need be, it still remains that he can produce a system uh, which is just as evil, as when man sets out uh, to do his worst. Or again, one can reflect that our very achievements menace us. I've been living for the last few months over in Pasadena, as your minister pointed out. And over there, every day in our weather forecast, we are told what it's going to be like smog-wise. And uh, for us, smog has now become a a very important feature of life. Here you see we have the achievement of man and his ability to manufacture, and specifically to manufacture automobiles, which is threatening the very atmosphere in which he lives. Every breath we draw over there is a breath of polluted air. And it isn't only in Pasadena that this happens. Uh, We have trouble in a lot of areas uh, with our inability to uh, to run the land properly. We have dust bowls and the like. Uh, we have pollution of rivers and lakes and so on. So that man's achievement menaces his environment. May I draw your attention to the protest movements which are so much part of life. 
Yes, at the moment, with all the students on vacation, there aren't so many of them, but nobody, I think, expects anything other than a lot more protest when the next academic year gets going. Not only are students caught up in protest, others are also. Protest, marches, the violence and demonstrations are part of life. Now, if you look at the speeches and the writings of the protesters, a very interesting thing emerges. They are vocal enough and clear enough in the things they are protesting against. They are against the establishment with all that that means, and they spell it out in considerable detail. But what are they for? It's very, very difficult to find out. It may be that there are some protesters who are pretty clear about what they want, but mostly they are not. And I think that this again represents the, uh, the pessimism of the world. It is possible to look out at a tremendous society like our own and to pick all kinds of holes in it. There are faults. And the, the protest movement underlines those faults and demonstrates for us uh, that we really have made quite a mess of running our lives. So that all this adds up to a, a pessimism about human achievement, and it's not at all surprising that the best modern writing is largely tragedy. Uh, it, it's, it's frankly pessimistic, and our best writers see no real future for us at all. But over against that, the Christian said a resounding optimism. The Christian isn't pessimistic at all. The Christian doesn't go along with the idea that evil has to be connived at and accepted as... Uh, uh, one of those things that always will be and always will triumph, it won't. There is a triumph in Christ. Uh, for the Christian, right at the heart of his faith, there is a cross. And on that cross there hung one, both God and man, who died to put away his sin. And for the Christian, the cross speaks eloquently of forgiveness and of renewal. The Christian knows in the light of Calvary that God cares. God isn't a remote, indifferent God enthroned in a lost in some celestial region, infinitely removed from the concerns of men, who lets men carry on the best they can and forgets them. That isn't the God whose symbol is a cross. That isn't the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Rather, he is one who has a tremendous concern for each and every individual one of us. Do you remember how in John's Gospel, Jesus gives us the illustration of the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep? Now, a shepherd in ancient Palestine knew his sheep, knew them as individuals, gave them names. He could call a sheep and that one sheep would come to him. And this is a way Jesus has of bringing out the thought that God loves us all. He doesn't just look down and see a tremendous mass of Christians and say, on the whole, I'm for them. He knows them. John and Jane, every one of them, individually, knows more about us than we know about ourselves. And he loves us with a deep and profound love, a love which gives, a love which we see vividly brought out on Calvary. And in the light of the cross and the resurrection and the ascension, the Christian can't be pessimistic. He can, as I said earlier, he can be and he is pessimistic about man's unaided ability uh, to rise superior to his problems. Man can't do it, and the Christian denies that he can. But the Christian is not, in the ultimate sense, pessimistic. He is supremely optimistic. He doesn't see in the miseries and frustrations and difficulties of the world around about him the last word. There is a wisdom of God. The world can't pick it up because it's reflected in a cross. And because, very often, those who live by the cross and those who proclaim the cross are not the wise ones as the world counts wisdom. Remember this bit that we read earlier? You see your calling, brethren, how not many wise men after the flesh, not many noble and so on are called. God has chosen the weak things, the foolish things. And this is so. God works his miracles of grace in humdrum, ordinary people. And because he does this very often, that goes unrecognized. But God does do his miracles, and the Christian 
is sure accordingly that the power of God can enable his people to triumph over all the evil that they meet. There is available grace for forgiveness and for renewal, and by the grace of God we can rise triumphant over whatever difficulties and evils confront us. And so I, what I want to say as we start this institute together is that there is a proper balance between optimism and pessimism. The Christian is no starry-eyed innocent who cannot see the evil in man. He can see it. He knows it's there and he's not deceived by man's achievement. But the Christian is not swept off his feet either by the ability of man to do certain great things. He knows that there is an inherent limitation, but it's in the power of God that that limitation can be surpassed. And so this um, wisdom of God in a mystery of which Paul speaks is a balanced wisdom, a wisdom which recognizes man's limitation, but which recognizes also God's power, which is able to say in the words of Paul to the Philippians, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. You see, you have there the optimism, I can do all things, but you also have the realization of man's limitation. It's through Christ which strengthens us, and not in any other way that man is able to make this achievement. God grant that this may become increasingly real to each of us. Let us bow our heads in prayer. We thank thee, O God, for the pure and peaceable wisdom that is from above. We thank thee that it is different from the wisdom of this world and that it enables men to overcome the evil that is within them and to triumph over whatever difficulty they encounter. And so as we bow before thee this day, we pray that thou wilt guide and direct us thy servants, and that we may rely not on our own feeble ability, but on thy mighty power and strong in thy strength we may go forward to do thy good and perfect will through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord. Amen. Here ends the reading of the Word of God.